Hello, my name is Daniel Burgess. Um, I want to talk about the Old Testament and its relevance to the New Testament and to us as Christians. And I'm going to be talking about how the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life, which is a quote from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Start in verse 2. It says, You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, as in the, the covenant with Moses, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust we have through Godward, uh, through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves, that we're capable of anything on our own, but our sufficiency is of God. God's the reason why we're able to do anything. Who also have made us ministers of the new covenant, New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The letter killeth under the letter of the law, without judging righteous judgment. People were condemned to die, but under the spirit of the law, you were. The law is a demonstration of what righteousness would be, regardless of the things that we do. The law is for sinners to know when they transgress. But let's look at the, the letter killeth. Let's flip to Matthew 3.13. says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou unto me? And Jesus answering and said unto him, Suffer it now to be so, for it becometh, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And thus he suffered him. John Lightfoot, in his uh, commentary on verse 15, when Christ says, uh, Suffer baptizing me now, that it becometh to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, Lightfoot, in his commentary, says, Thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. That is, we fulfill everything that is just. Now in the baptism of Christ, there were two things, especially one that this great priest being initiated into his ministerial office should answer to the type of admission the Levitical priests who were initiated by washing and anointing, and so was he by baptism and the Holy Ghost. So, when Jesus says it was to fulfill all righteousness, he's answering to the Old Testament uh, priestly purification, because he's going to start his ministry as a rabbi. And Verse 16, it says, Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove, and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And touching moment in Scripture, right? This book right here is called The Death and the resurrection of the beloved son the transformation of child sacrifice in judaism and christianity by john d levinson it's a great book it's a little rough because it's talking about child sacrifice so if anybody gets this book be prepared for that page 30 but concerning the voice from heaven It says, When in the synoptic gospels a heavenly voice declares, just after Jesus' baptism, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Mark 1.11 and the parallels from the synoptic gospels. A reference to that other beloved son, Isaac, is surely to be understood. And a Jewish audience, well versed in the Torah, and perhaps even in the Septuagint as well, 
would have recognized the dark side of the heavenly announcement that the destiny of the son so loved and so favored included a symbolic death at the hands of his loving father. The theme of the life-giving death of the only begotten and beloved son at the hands of his divine father is nowhere so succinctly put as in the fourth gospel. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Gave is the Greek word edokin. It reflects the usual language of child sacrifice in the Hebrew Bible, beginning where we began with our own discussion in Exodus 22, verse 28. You shall, you shall give me the firstborn among your sons. And continuing throughout the tradition of the Hebrew Bible, including Ezekiel, who describes the immolation of the firstborn as the presentation of a gift. In Ezekiel 20, verse 31. And someone familiar with the Phoenician tradition, John 3, 16, would recall not only the sacrificial death of Edod or Eod at the hands of Kronos or El, but perhaps also Philo of Biblius' account of the children given up with mystic rites. That was chapter 3 on the sacrifice of the son as the imitation of God. It's a great book. Use it again. But when God says, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, what he was referring to was the, it's called the aquita, but that's just a variant of the Haggadah, which is what the Jews call the traditions, and they're trying, it, it, the word can mean to bind. And so they refer to the immolation of Isaac by Abraham, his father. Uh, they identify it by Abraham binding his son to the altar on top of the wood, uh, expressing his readiness to obey the Lord. Genesis 22, verse 2. Sorry, a newer Bible. It's harder for me to flip around in. It says, and he, and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. When it says, now take thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. Whom thou lovest is one word in Hebrew. It's alhab, alhab. And Strong says that that word means to be loved, the beloved. So take your beloved son, Isaac, is what God told him. So when God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, then he was calling him by the same thing that he called Isaac to Abraham when he told him to sacrifice his son. In the New Testament, when God says it, it just if anybody wants it, beloved is the word agapatos, which also means beloved, esteemed, or favorite. Now let's flip to Matthew 11. Verse 2 says, Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do see and hear. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And he, and blessed is he who, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Because John's being offended. John saw a miracle. John baptized Jesus and saw heaven open and heard the voice from heaven speak about God's beloved son. And now that he's in jail, he's like, are you the Messiah? 
Because John got himself put in jail. And we'll see that in a minute. In verse 11, it says, Verily, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there have not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent lay hold of it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, he was Elias, Elijah, who was, who was for to come. Elijah or Elisha. I, the Greek spelling confuses me on Elias, Elijah, and Isaiah. So they look the same. But when it says that John the Baptist is the greatest, it's because he was the last prophet to announce Christ, and he got to meet Christ. None of the other prophets that prophesied Christ got to meet Christ. So John's the greatest in that sense. But he's the least in the kingdom of heaven in the sense that he doesn't understand that he's supposed to be suffering persecution for the word of God. He doesn't know. But the least in the kingdom of the Messiah knows because Jesus has told us plainly. He who has ears, let, let him hear him. Now let's flip to Matthew 14. Verse 1. At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus, and he said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist, he is risen from the dead, therefore mighty works doth he show forth in themselves in him. So a after he murdered John the Baptist, he was alive in chapter 11 and he's dead now. And Herod thinks that he's come back from the dead. Uh, and that's why he's able to do all these miracles. He's thinking, you know, it's a phantom running around. <clears throat> Uh, it, for Herod had laid hold on John the Baptist and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet, the greatest prophet. That brother's wife, he said, It's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Lawful, a better sense... It's the Greek word existi, lawful. Legal would be a better sense here. It's not legal for you to be having an affair with your brother's wife. Uh, it, and as a matter of fact, you're condemned to die by Jewish law. Let's flip over to Leviticus 18, I believe, 18, 16. It says, Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. And, and flip over again to verse 20, chapter 20, verse 10. Excuse me, chapter 20, verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. So, what John essentially did was the Messiah's here, the Messiah's going to take over. Everybody thought the Messiah was going to take the kingdom of Israel back from the world powers, from Rome. And they were expecting the Messiah to kick the Roman government out of Israel first and then to conquer the world. That's what the Jews expected from the Messiah when the Messiah would come. And so all the people around Jesus that know Jesus know he's the Messiah, but then they believe that all of this physical kingdom stuff is going to happen. And so they start getting excited and uh, creating a lot of tension and doing a lot of, I don't know if I want to say stupid things, but uh, I mean, he got his head cut off telling, telling, uh, 
telling Herod that, you know, he was condemned to die by Jewish law. You're in Israel and you're condemned to die. He's like, okay, well, I'll just throw you in jail. Cut your head off. First chance I get. And uh, when Herod was seduced by his niece, he gave her whatever she wanted and she asked for John the Baptist's head. And then he knew he got duped. But... So Herod and Herodias were condemned by the letter. Letter of the law. Let's look at uh, Matthew 16, verse 13. It says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? Say that I, the Son of Man, am. Excuse me. And, and they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias, Elias, others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom, whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answering him and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So, God in heaven is the one who, who reveals Jesus Christ as the Messiah. That's what Jesus said. And so if you believe that Jesus is your Savior and the Messiah, it's because God's the one opening your eyes to it. And you're going to have to answer to your conscience about it. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I believe the rock, uh, Peter's the little rock, the, and then he said upon this great big rock, this great big boulder, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ from heaven, will God build his church. That's what this is talking about. It's not Peter's the first pope. That's not what this is saying. And I will give thee unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And that's binding and loosing, and that's the job of a rabbi. The rabbis would go around and they say, yes, that's according to the law. No, that's not according to the law. No, that's breaking the law. And these are the consequences or the rewards for those types of circumstances. That's what the rabbis did. They went around and Bind and loose. And so when Jesus, the master rabbi, is revealed to you from heaven, then he's going to send you out a sheep among wolves. <sighs> a sheep among wolves, he's going to send you out, but, and you're going to go bind and loose in the name of Jesus. And then he charged his disciples that no man should tell that he was, he was the Christ. And from that time forth, he began to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And Peter, Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he t <laughs> so Jesus is like, okay, look, this is the real kingdom of the Messiah. I'm going to go and die to the flesh. And I'm going to put the flesh of Israel down in a tomb and God's going to bring me up because I fulfilled all the law through love, through loving my enemies by dying for him. Mm. And you're telling me that that's evil because you want me to like lead an army and conquer the world. Get behind me, Satan, is what he said to Peter. Hmm. He called him Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. Who was swallowed in the belly of the well. I, I believe that's because Peter didn't really start shaping up until after that Jesus was in the tomb for three, three days. Not to get into the chronology of that, but... But that's what I think Jesus was referring to. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, after I come out of the belly of the tomb, then you're going to start binding and loosening. I think that's why Jesus called him Simon Barjona right here. Food for thought. But they wanted Jesus to conquer and rule the world by the letter of the law. And God hid it. He's like, hey, this is going to be a spiritual kingdom. And... It's not going to be dominating this world in the flesh. It's not, it's not what 
God's going to do. Verse 24, Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny, contradict himself, and take up his cross and follow me. Let him bear his guilt. Be guilty. You're a sinner. Follow after me. I'll, I'll teach you how to have a... I'll teach you the Spirit of God, and then maybe you can change your life. And so there ain't no stopping the Spirit. Once it starts to take over your life, there ain't, you ain't, you ain't going to stop it. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. You've got to lose your life for Jesus' sake. Let's look at John 18. Verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where he was in a garden uh, into which he entered and his disciples in Gethsemane. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with his disciples. Ju Judas then, having received a band of men and, an, and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. And Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth, because he was God, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? And they answered him and said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus saith unto them, I am. It doesn't say I am he. He said, I am. He's declaring himself God. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as they... As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. So Jesus saying, I am, made them all fall to the ground, knocked them over with force. And then he asked again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered and said, I have told you that I am. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them which Thou gavest me, I have lost none. And then Simon Peter, having drew a sword and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear, the servant's name was Malchus. Then Jesus, then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword and thy sheaf. The cup which my father have given me, shall I not drink it? You're still trying to stop me? You're still trying to conquer the world, Peter? I have to go die to impart to y'all the spirit that's going to, Teach y'all to stop destroying everything with the will of the flesh and to worship God in spirit and truth. Mm. But Jesus saying, I am, and knocking them to the ground is, uh, was a test of testimony that he was the Messiah and that he was God in the flesh and that he was laying his life down and that no one was taking his life from him, which is what he said. So, I'll just say this real quick. Uh, all of Israel was expecting the Messiah when Jesus showed up because Daniel, the prophet in his book, prophesied exactly when Jesus was going to when the Messiah was going to show up. So, all of the scholars like knew to look for the Messiah because Daniel told them when to look. And and so that's why all this hustle and bustle of conquering and, and exiling Rome from the land of Israel like was on everybody's mind at this point. You know, it, it all kind of went crazy. Let's go to John 8, verse 1. Jesus went out of the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote in the ground as though he heard them not. And when they continued asking him, they, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast the stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote in the ground. 
And they which heard it, being convicted in their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And Jesus lifted himself up and saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Mm. Mercy. By the letter of the law, she was condemned to die. But she obtained mercy through the Spirit. But this gets interesting. Let's flip to... Uh, well, let me read Adam Clark commentary on the eldest to the last. It's kind of a weird thing. But Adam Clark's commentary on John... 8 verse 9 says, being convicted by their own conscience. So it is likely they were all guilty of similar crimes. Their own is not the original and is needless. Being convicted by conscience is expressive enough. Beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, from the most honorable to those of the least repute. In this sense, the words are undoubtedly to be understood. The woman standing in the midst but if they all went out, how could she be in the midst? Is it not said that all the people whom our Lord had been instructing went out, but only her accusers? Uh, the rest undoubtedly continued with their teacher. Because Jesus immediately starts teaching, like the next verse. He, he says, Go and sin no more. Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, and he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And the Pharisees are still upset. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. And Jesus said, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go. And ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, and I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me are one. Uh, And it is written in your law that the testimony of two men is true, and that if one bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. So there's two witnesses. But, yeah, it says eldest, but it, it meant like the, el the wisest of them to the last. And, it, and the reason, <laughs> we're going to see why they needed wisdom. Let's go back to Leviticus 20, verse 10 says, And if a man committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. You've got to have both of them. And the man that lieth with his father's wife and have uncovered his father's nakedness, both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And then... So both the man and the woman had to come. Let's go to Numbers 25. Numbers 25, verse 6, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation. There's a lot going on. I'm going to have to back up. Let me start from the top of the chapter. And, it, and Israel abode in Shittim. Shittim means the place of sticks or poles. That's what Shittim means. And the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, and they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down unto their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Bel Peor, Bel Figor, uh, at the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And uh, Bel Peor was the god of the Moabites. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. Go crucify them. Go impale them on poles. 
And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay every one his men that were joined to Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought his brethren with a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation and the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Uh, he just brought the woman. He didn't bring the man. He just brought the woman. And when Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through. And the man of Israel and the woman through her belly so that the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. There's so much good stuff going on in here. It's also crazy. But they dragged the woman... They were in the sight of all the congregation. Where did it go? They were in the they were in the door to the temple, the tabernacle, fornicating. That's what the scholars think that they were like. It was normal to commit fornication in the gates of pagan gods' temples, you know. And so, so they're trying to do that. In God's temple, and God's like, I ain't going for that. I'm going to start killing everybody. And God kills 2,300 people, impaling them on trees, throwing them through the air, while Moses and his judges kill about 100. <laughs> Moses and all of, all of his judges got 100. God got 2,300. It's like one of those terrible basketball games. But... And because they were committing fornication, the man was piercing her with the javelin, so they were punished by being impaled with the javelin uh, and it, there's literary evidence for that interpretation I don't know if I can find this quick enough Mary Douglas in her book on Leviticus his literature and One second. In chapter 10, on page 210, she says, Whatever it was, Moses was occupied with impaling the ringleaders of mass apostasy, and he had been commanded by God, and Phineas decided to impale these two offenders on his own initiative. The plague which the anger of God stopped at once. And the Lord said to Moses, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people, in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore, say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after him that the covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for his people." Like, it was going from bad to worse if they were about to murder the woman without murdering the man. It was about to get ugly. I mean, God was already just, you know, on a mission to annihilate people. Moses and his judges trying to keep up. The speech is more vivid in the translation used by Milgram's JPS commentary. He says, Phineas turned back my wrath from the Israelites by displaying among them his passion for me so that I did not wipe out the Israelites in my passion. Uh, she's showing literary structures. She says, or literally in his becoming impassioned by my passion. Milgram says, Phineas's passion matched that of God were slain in brutally enforced and lethal embrace. Sexual penetration was punished by the penetrating spear. Zimri, the penetrator, was himself penetrated. Then the anger of God was matched by the anger of Phineas. Passion matched passion. Next, God discerning the expiation and atonement had been made, found it the occasion to make the final requital. He announces a perpetual pact of friendship with Phineas and his descendants, in his concluding words about the pact and ransom are already replete with the idea of Talion. A free reading of the Lord's speech would go something uh, somewhat as follows. Phineas did turn away my wrath. 
His passion for his God matched his God's own passion, and he paid the ransom for Israel, and I repay him with my pact. And she goes on to explain the significance of all the names of the characters in those stories. But, so you got to have both the man and the woman. And so let's look at Deuteronomy 19 concerning the woman taken in adultery. Verse 16 says, If a false witness rise up against any man or woman to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priest and the judges, what shall be in those days, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall you do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. And those which shall remain shall hear and fear, and henceforth commit no more such evil among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, by the letter of the law, condemned to die. So all of these people that brought the woman without the man were condemned to die by their own law because they didn't obey the law and they're trying to destroy a person with the law. So they all had to die. So when Jesus stoops down and starts drawing in the ground, um, most likely he was drawing their condemnation by the letter of the law. And the, from the wisest of them to the least, left one by one. So, it's enlightening. It's a really good passage to demonstrate uh, the relationship of the Old Testament to the New Testament. <clears throat> well, let's flip to Luke 15. Verse 11, And a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Give me that portion of goods that falleth unto me, and he divideth unto him his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And when he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And when he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father's house and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and kissed him and ran and had compassion on him, fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto his father, I have sinned against heaven and earth in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to the servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring it thither, the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. So he received mercy from his father. He received mercy from the letter of the law. The letter of the law, there's a law about rebellious sons that want to be drunkards and And we're going to look at it. It's called the, or it's in uh, Deuteronomy 21, verse 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father, the voice of his mother, that when they have chastened him, he will not hearken unto them. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold of him and bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This is our son. He is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton. 
and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. And so shall you put that evil away from among you. And all of Israel shall hear and fear. So by the letter of the law, he was condemned to die. He rebelled against his father's house and went and became a fool and a drunkard and squandered everything. And he was condemned to die by the letter of the law, but he received mercy from his father by the spirit of the law. Because he said, I have received my son who was dead and is alive again. So it's the type of resurrection. But Jesus was extremely familiar. I mean, we know Jesus knew the book of Deuteronomy. He knows all the books. He knows all the books. But in the temptation of Christ... Jesus rebukes the devil with Deuteronomy all three times, all three temptations. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy. And the passage immediately before the law of the rebellious son and the passage immediately after the law of the rebellious son point to Christ directly. Uh, But you have the law of inheritance, which is verse 15 of the same chapter in Deuteronomy 21. It says, If a man have two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they both have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, and if the firstborn be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed firstborn. But he should acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving them a double portion of all that they have, for he is the beginning of his strength, and the right of the firstborn is his. That's the letter of the law. Not, you don't get to pick which wife you like and, and, and which kid gets to be your firstborn inheritor. You can't change that. And uh, by the letter of the law and the spirit of promise was a lot different. Uh, I'm gonna, let's look at the death and resurrection of the beloved son again on page 55. Chapter 7. <clears throat> says, the intention of this law is to prevent the status of a man's wives from impairing the claim of the husband's firstborn son as chief heir to his father's estate. That the scenario it envisions is not hypothetical is suggested by narratives in which the father prefers the late-born son of a favored wife over the firstborn of an unfavored one. Abraham, for example, accepts, though not without hesitation, the demand of his primary wife, Sarah, that he expel his firstborn son, Ishmael, offspring of his secondary wife, Sarah's Egyptian slave, Hagar, so that Sarah's son, Isaac, Abraham's second, will not have to share the inheritance, Genesis 21, verse 9 through 13. Similarly, Jacob, who in language strikingly reminiscent of Deuteronomy 21, 15 through 17, the law of the inheritance that we're talking about, loved Rachel more than Leah, who was unloved, in turn, loved Rachel's son Joseph, best of all his sons, and transferred the status of firstborn from his own two oldest sons, Reuben and Simeon, to Joseph's boys, Ephraim and Manasseh. So, and that happened to bring Christ in. So, the letter of the law forbid the inheritance going from anybody but the true firstborn, regardless of whether you love or hate one of your wives. But the Spirit of God had a different agenda and was going to bring Christ through the spirit of the law and not the letter of the law. And, and just, as, just as Abraham's two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, uh, the firstborn not receiving the blessing, but the secondborn receiving the blessing, so the nation body of Israel... The flesh and blood nation represents the firstborn 
And they're not going to receive the inheritance, but God's going to give it to Christ. So, direct bearing, direct bearing on Jesus' parable, Jesus' life, and interpretation of the law. But immediately following after the law of inheritance is the law of the rebellious son, and then it's followed by the law of the accursed in verse 22, which we'll read. It says, If a man have committed any sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, thou shalt hang him on a tree, and his body shall not remain on a tree all night, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged on a tree is accursed of God, that the land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. And when they hung Jesus on a tree, <clears throat> he became accursed for us, which we're going to look at. But in this verse 23, it's the last verse where it says, He that is hanged on a tree is cursed of God, that the land be not defiled. That's how you interpret crucifixion. And when you understand that like your blood was your soul substance or your breath was your soul substance, if you stop breathing, your spirit came out through your mouth and your blood would stop flowing inside of your body. So they thought your blood and your breath were the same thing. And, and that would happen in reverse. If you bled to death, you'd stop breathing. So your breath would go out through your blood. That's what they believed. And so when you impale somebody above the earth, so the earth's not defiled with their soul substance, you're, you're exiling them spiritually away from the earth, away from you and your people, and their soul substance is going to come out of them above the earth that the land be not defiled. It's very interesting. Very interesting. Let's see here. And we've already seen the law of the accursed in action in Numbers 25 when God and Moses and his judges are impaling everybody. They're doing this law here in Deuteronomy. But let's flip to Galatians 3, verse 10. I believe we'll end here. It says, For as many as are under the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things that are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. You're only going to find eternal life through the law if you obey every commandment and precept. And if you're guilty in one point, you're guilty of all, is what it says in the book of James. <clears throat> and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. And Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law that separates us from God, Curse means exile, to drive out. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, everyone, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So, you're cursing them. You're, dri you're exiling them. Anatha, Maranatha, get out of here. You're driving their soul out from the land. And that's what the Jews did to Jesus. And so, his soul came out from them and on to the Gentiles. This stuff, man. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, just like Abraham. You know, the Word of God came to him, and he, he believed it, and it was counted to him for righteousness because he believed the Word of God and did what it said. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet it, if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth it or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, he saith, not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. The whole purpose of the promise of the whole covenant was to be fulfilled in Christ. And this I say, that the covenant was confirmed before God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, 
cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. The, the law was 430 years after Abraham and the promise that was made to Abraham, is what he's saying. And the law can't negate the promise that was given to Abraham. For the inheritance... Uh, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of the transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one. It's, you've got to go between two people. But God is one. Is the law then... Against the promises of God, God forbid, for if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness would have been by the law. But there wasn't a law given that could give life. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise of the, by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which would afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster, our teacher, our instructor, our tutor, to bring us to Christ. Because if we try to keep the law, we're going to see that we failed it and that we're condemned to die. And, and then the law is going to instruct us that we need a better covenant that can change our nature and change our eternal status in relation to God. But after that faith was come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now that the faith of Christ has arised, we don't need to be under the law anymore to teach us that sin is wrong. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put him on in duo. To, you're going to put on your Jesus outfit. <laughs> That's what it's saying. You're going to wear the high priest robe. Jesus is the high priest. You're going to put on him as a robe. He's going to make you a priest. And he says, uh, There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So when Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son, of a who was a rebellious son, uh, and, you, and you bring the context of Deuteronomy to the things that Jesus was saying there, it bears on Jesus' parable, and it bears on Paul's description. I mean, Paul was talking about the law of the accursed and the law of the inheritance, which are both from the same passage in Deuteronomy. So, so these things go together. I say these things out of a love for others and a love of life in Christ's name. Amen.